Welcome back to the Tax Advisor and Biz Coach Success Podcast. The purpose of these episodes is to help entrepreneurs become more successful, avoid tax and other business headaches. Remember to tune in frequently as we will be sharing tips, secrets, and expert recommendations in how you can manage your finances, improve wealth, and grow your business. Please like, share, and subscribe. Here's your host, Liz Soria. Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome again. This is Liz Soria, your host of the Tax Advisor and Business Coach Success Podcast. I'm truly, truly honored to have back Dr. Jason Ross. Um, this is actually the first time that I have had one single guest actually doing more than one episode. So, uh, Dr. Ross, thank you so much for joining us again today. And, you. Uh, and how are you today? Good? Awesome. Great. Um, and today it's going to be a different, different topic because I really believe that as a business owner, um, well, we deal with different situations. And in, in the last episode, for some of you who have not watched it or have not heard the episode, please do. It was about psychotherapy for a healthier lifestyle. And um, Jason gave us very wonderful tips and things that we really need uh, to improve our lives. And But this topic today, we're going to talk about system abuse and epidemic. Uh, because this is a true reality. It's sad, but it's happening. And I think there's something that we need to deal with. So again, uh, Dr. Jason uh, Ross, if you can give us a little bit of your background again, that way people are familiar if they haven't heard the, the other episode and they understand exactly um, what makes you qualify to discuss this kind of topic and your expertise, please. Sure. Uh, again, thanks for having me back. Uh, I'm Jason Welcome. Ross. I'm a licensed psychotherapist, mental health counselor in New York and Florida. I'm actually the son of two psychoanalysts, not one, but two. Um, so I grew up in and around the field, so to speak. I started my career in uh, psychology, uh, training to be a school psychologist. A number of years later, I made a slight transition and I got involved in uh, the chronic mental health and substance abuse side. I started training at a psych uh, hospital, for lack of a better term, called South County Mental Health Center in Delray Beach, Florida. Oh. And it was an eye-opening experience uh, seeing things, you know, head on and having to handle situations that are basically of an emergency nature. And you really end up seeing, uh, you know, if you grow up in New York, if nowhere else, you see what can happen to people. You see people in different, you know, downtrodden states. Here you're seeing it in your face and you actually have to be able to assist and help and come up with solutions. So I got a, an inordinate experience starting there, worked in one or two uh, substance abuse treatment centers in the Boca del Rey area, which is often known as the Mecca of rehab uh, in the country. That's true. I did not know because I'm from here from Florida like you. So uh, for those who, know, who don't know, but I'm in South Florida too. So, and I know you told me that previously that you're in, um, in Miami, uh, Miami two area. So... I did not know that. That's very interesting. Is Florida one of the worst states when it comes to uh, really uh, addiction? Well, it certainly is. The opiate crisis. This is opium. Opiate, you know, uh, different types of painkillers, etc. We have we've had an epidemic. They finally did start to crack down. People uh, were prevented from doctor shopping the way they used to. They used to be able to get tons of pills. There was an episode of American Greed this past Monday on CNBC uh, about a gentleman who had really perpetuated a lot of fraud, uh, a lot of patient brokering. So you can see what happens. But generally, if you look up the Palm Beach Post and look up opiate crisis, sober homes, substance abuse issues, you're gonna see a ton of articles. So there's, I, it's across the board, but treatment wise, Florida is one of the two biggest. Wow, that's- Northern California. This is where people send their kids, send their family members from all around, but definitely the Northeast. This is the corridor. It comes, boom, right down. Incredible. Yeah, and I've heard about this, actually. Um, I know of other people that work in the industry, and opium is definitely one of the biggest addictions that they have in, in Florida. There's no doubt about that, so I agree with you on that one. Um, how do we recognize that we might be inclined, just to say in a, in a simple word, sure. um, of falling into an addiction. 
because sometimes we do certain things and we think it's okay as long as we have a control limitation to it. But how do we recognize the fact that we're falling into a bad addiction? Um, is there any signs to it that we can recognize as, as a person or, or it's just, it happens? We fall very yeah. 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 What everybody needs to learn, there are signs. And I think with most people, the sign is they have a suspicion. Okay. When, for many of us, we, we have a thought that a loved one might be doing something. Maybe our gut is telling us something right. The, one of the biggest signs you'll see is the, the two that come to mind are the changes in behavior, changes in mood, and ultimately what an addiction affects is connectivity. When people are you know, going into the abyss of addiction, what we see is they detach emotionally and they are less available personally, emotionally, and physically. And most people recognize that clearly and painfully. Now, that's all well and good. The second part of it's the tougher part is getting to the point where you see the other person needs help and you need to get them help or to get them more over to understand that they need help. That's the tough part. That's the tough part. Mm -hmm. Because um, will you say that it's because even though, in this case, let's talk about the patient, right? The person who's suffering this addiction. Uh, might have signs that there's something changing and they're just being more attached to this, you know, call it recreation or drug, as they call it, right? <laughs> uh, or whatever it might be, whether it could be drugs, it could be marijuana, right? And now it's being legalized so much, and that's a concern that I have uh, across the nation. That, that's just my share. So um, and, concern. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the other thing is the fact that it was for cigarettes, right? When they're, you know, when, when the government decided, sure, we're going to go ahead and, um, you know, approve nicotine. And then look what happened. A lot more people became addicted to nicotine because cigarettes you could purchase anywhere. So now you didn't have to hide and go anywhere else. The same thing happened with alcohol, right? And the times where alcohol was, you know, legal and then they legalize it. So my concern with marijuana is a little bit there. Um, but the ones that are not legalized are the ones that for some reason people are even more attracted to. <laughs> so when a patient can start recognizing signs, um, what's the first steps that they need to do to hopefully not fall deeper into the hole and make it harder for them to climb out? Well, if, if, if someone does recognize the signs and they're willing to get some help, that's the starting point. The problem is most people who are in it don't and will not and don't want to see it. Okay. So helping them to recognize that there is a problem. Uh, you know, the old phrase, the first part of, of, you know, fixing a problem is recognizing you have a problem. Most people don't want to do that. So the problem we have now is that there's all different substances and there's this notion that if something's legal, it's okay. Right. Uh, cyanide, I believe, is legal. I don't think taking it is a good idea, obviously, because it can kill you. <laughs> you know, so like, it, everybody wants to say it's legal. That doesn't make it, you can jump off certain bridges. It's legal. Oh, Not right. a great idea. Right, we, we've told ourselves what we want to, to believe it, so we can detach from the world. Uh, what I, a couple of things that are really important to point out, the majority of people that I've ever worked with, with opiate addiction, their, their first drug and their drug of choice beforehand was marijuana. Really? Interesting. Yeah. Very it interesting. Now, let, let's also, I like to be neutral about all these kind of, you know, uh, topics. I mean, marijuana, it's beneficial. I mean, it, it does do a lot of good things for our health, but again, I think it's like anything else that, and I'm not a, a I'm not a, I don't do marijuana, but I know that some people, they, they do, and for them, they prefer have, you know, a marijuana, you know, versus to a cigarette, right? So, I mean, is, is there anything positive about marijuana, especially, I guess, for patients who have cancer and AIDS? Definitely, there's well, a big benefit to those. Right. So, there's, there's a handful of, let's just take three medical conditions. You know, let's say cancer, um, you know, if someone's, you know, in full-blown um, you know, AIDS or glaucoma. Let's just say it's those three. Well, we know medically there are some 
benefits, at least as uh, the pain relief. You know, we're, you, we've heard enough stories that you can buy that. Now, right. the average 17 year old does not have glaucoma. Good so, point. Right. So we got to look at, you know, yeah, great. It may help the, you know, the, the PTSD uh, for the war veteran. Great. I'm all for them getting what they need at this point. Okay. But learn early not to cope. So uh, the medical component, uh, the cannabidiols, the CBD, uh, it can be extracted. When it's the THC, which is the psychoactive component, people don't need that. Now, the average person anyway doesn't. Uh, so, I, you know, I've heard cancer patients smoking, you know, et cetera. Okay, it relieves their, okay. But if you don't have cancer, why are you doing it? And smoking anything isn't good. We know, you don't, it's incontrovertible evidence that smoking does not lead to better anything. Anything. It's not, you know, it's not like it gives you your recommended daily allowance of, you know, iron or calcium. It doesn't do any of that. <laughs> so people want to believe that, you know, oh, it's natural. However, the problem is um, pot is now basically farmed. It's manufactured. And while it comes from the ground, I understand that. Uh, that doesn't make it okay. The THC levels are higher. What it does do is it affects the brain stronger. And in a younger, under, underdeveloped brain, which is anything under 25, you're going to have a problem. Wow. Under 25. I was not aware of that. I thought it was like under maybe, you know, in the teens, uh, as you're under the age of 17, you know. The brain, yeah, the brain develops. So, and again, you know, uh, the brain is the biggest organ. So why would we mess with that? There'd be no good reason. So, uh, you know, from a medical benefit, th there's clearly evidence that suggests there are some medical benefits, but smoking does not generate that per se. And the idea is people want to get high, and I understand that they do. That doesn't make it a good idea. And if your child's underdeveloped, if they want to do that, you have to wonder why do they want to do that versus stay in the moment and be present. And you mentioned recreational. Right. Uh, well, that's, that's the terminology they use in these days. Back in my time, I mean, you know, there was not such a thing as recreation. I mean, it was drugs. <laughs> I mean, right, exactly. we call it drugs. People, and like, to that, exactly. it. People like to use that term. <laughs> and drugs were bad. I mean, we knew back then drugs were bad. We've all been exposed one way or another. I mean, uh, for those who want to admit it and those that don't, uh, but I, I, I can tell you from my, my, my own personal experience, I used to be a smoker and I, I, I don't deny it and for a very long time and oh, oh goodness, thank you God, you know, I was able finally, uh, you know, to, to, to get rid of that addiction. So I do understand what addiction is because I lived it. I know what it was and for those who are listening to me, and perhaps there's still smokers to say, tell them, please quit smoking. Really, it's going to be such a relief the day that you quit that you're not going to believe it, how amazing you're going to feel. Because not knowing that you don't have to wake up and run to that cigarette or having to have it after your meals or whatever, is such an amazing feeling of knowing that you just got disconnected of something that you thought it was so profound. And part of your life as a daily routine. However, I will not give up my coffee. I love caffeine. So that's one thing I'm not going to give up no matter what. But nicotine, you know, at least with a cigarette, I got rid of it. And um, I'm still in the process. I admit it. I'm vaping. I like to share my own true story. I'm still in the process. But at least I have not lit another cigarette. And I, I don't think I would because, again, you brought up a very good point. Anything that you smoke is not natural. I mean, it's, it's bad for our bodies, our lungs, right? They're not able to process that smoke into our body. That's correct. The, the lungs are there for a reason. And they're not, they're not able to do everything you want. Everybody has this idea that I can do whatever I want and there's no consequences. And that's just, I mean, that's like being stoned. I mean, that's just insane. So people, you know, can get addicted to different things. And the reality is the mindset you have going in also may uh, give some indication of how addicted you might become. Depending on how strong the substances are, well, it can be much more powerful. Uh, on, the, on the flip side of, you know, people smoking weed, we have seen a rise in the uh, episodes of psychotic events with young children. And I mean young, I mean teenagers to young adults. Because if what happens is they start smoking and then it's no longer recreational, it's habitual medicinal. And that's mm -hmm. the problem. And if the substance wasn't addictive, 
you wouldn't do it. Right. It, it, you know, this didn't happen years ago to the same degree because, you know, the reality is the strength, the concentration was different. So in the grand scheme of things, if somebody's doing this and they're medicating themselves and we've become a medication nation for sure, you have to ask, why are they doing it? So there's a prevention piece. And on the flip side, there's the intervention piece. What do you do if you're faced with it? Because ultimately, prevention is difficult. Um, parents can model behaviors. They can set the rules. But if there's any you know, cracks in the armor, you're going to be facing some issues. And that's why the substance abuse treatment business became actually in South Florida and Palm Beach County became the fourth largest industry. That's not by accident. Wow, that's incredible. That is truly incredible. And like you said, one of the epidemics that we've seen most, and it's not only here in the state of Florida, but across the nation and in a smaller degree, right? It's like you said, um, opium, but what other drugs are really affecting? What about uh, uh, painkillers, pills? I mean, things being, you know, they're, they're all in that, Yeah, they're all in that category. So yeah, out, of, out of the opiates, we have, we have uh, Vicodin, Oxycodone, uh, Roxaset, so there's a, a litany of them and uh, any, all the way up to, you know, morphine. So uh, people have learned to numb their feelings a lot of different ways. The painkillers, the opiates are very strong. That's why there's a lot of uh, legal issues going on right now, even in the government, with taking on the companies that produce the pills. So, and that's going to be huge. So the government has done something, certainly in Florida, to crack down on uh, the widespread problem. Again, it's, it's, it's got a long way to go, but the strength of these drugs is much higher than a human can handle. And that's one of the reasons we haven't seen that much of improvement. And the backdrop of it is with parenting, people have to learn a lot of coping skills more than ever. And we're seeing less of it. So your odds for addiction, in my view, would go up. Wow. That's sad. Very sad to, 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 to hear that. Um, Dr. Ross, here's my question. Um, how do you feel that these rehab centers are helping these patients? I mean, is this, a, 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 is it really working or is it more a business? Um, because well, I, I, I think that it's both. <laughs> That's the ultimate question. Does it, you know, people, you know, there's a, there's a side that's, you know, AA, which is, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and NA, Narcotics Anonymous, and they feel just show up at the meetings, get a sponsor, work a program, that'll fix everything. The other side is, well, rehab doesn't do it. I think the, the reason to go to rehab is you're in such danger, you need to be removed from the situation you're in. And or you have enough to work on, let's say, about your own personal trauma, you need to learn about uh, why you do this and, and really get to the underlying issues. That's difficult to do, and that's very difficult to do in 30 days, especially if somebody's been using drugs to a high degree. They're barely in the clear after two weeks. So there's a lot of myths. My one recommendation to people, this is really important for listeners, is that speak to professionals and people who have sent a family member. There are, there are patient brokers out there, there are people who do interventions, but you want someone who's really got the ethics, licenses where applicable, they really understand what to do. I've, you know, I've put people in rehab when I think it's appropriate. Some people go to rehab multiple times. You see this, like, oh, he went to 20 rehabs. That's ridiculous. Wow. Only that's 20 ridiculous. times is fine. Rehab, that's ridiculous. That's, that's an abuse. At a certain point, you have to say, something's not working here. Um, and it's difficult with a loved one because if you see them, you're afraid, rightfully so. The family has to get help. The family must, must get help. And I wanted to touch that part with you, by the way, because we, we're talking about the patient side, but the family needs the help too to cope with the situation, right? Sure. So it's sure. both sides that need really assistance and, and uh, you know, mental health you know, therapy uh, to go through the process of hopefully a happy ending. Right. They, know, they need to learn what to do. They need to learn how to change the way they handle things, the way they speak to the, you know, quote, affected client, the, 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 the addict, as we, you know, we would say, the alcoholic. So if the system has to change, the system is the oven that this, you know, bread is baked in. 
no, you know, no pun intended with baked. Um, the fact of the matter is a family needs to change the way they look at everything. And if they don't, it's the assumption that everything is wrong with the person who's the patient. It doesn't really work that way. That's, and a, that's a fix I, my kid or fix my family me mentality. It doesn't work. And enabling our loved ones or our friends could be another major issue. Because sometimes I think people would do it because the issue. they think that they're helping, but they're not. Quite the opposite. You may be you may be greasing the steps that this person is falling down. So when I deal with people, a lot of people will come to me and say, "We want you to treat our son," and I basically, almost invariably, I say no. I, and I tell the family that they need to come in. You need to work with me for a while, so you can do the job that I do. Because your child, if they're using drugs, isn't going to listen to me. That's a parenting job, and we have to know the difference. So very often that's the case. And a parenting job doesn't mean you have a child. It means you have someone who acts like one. It doesn't matter their age. It's really important to remember. Really? So it's not an age factor? Not as much. I mean, we, we, we interpret a child to be someone under a certain age. But right. what's, what drugs do, which is the real problem, is that they uh, stunt emotional and personal maturity and, and depth. So you have to play catch up. The bigger problem that we're finding now, and this is one thing that's happened with uh, all the legalization, et cetera, is the onset of use is younger than ever. We know children who are between 11 and 13, they're starting to mess with drugs. Oh, You're not even God. out of puberty, right. You're not even horrible. out of puberty. Horrible, Right, that's a deal breaker as far as I'm concerned, and we don't do enough to stop that, we don't. So everybody's pushing legalization, and theoretically it could, it could help on one level, but why do children ever get access? It should never happen with that. And these teenagers are now starting earlier because the pressures, they want to detach, and this is what they've learned, and they can get access. And at the end of the day, whoever's giving them the drugs is not punished. That's very sad. And you know, from a, from a medical uh, perspective, like you said, our, our brains are not even fully developed. So imagine, uh, a young teenager at that age between 11, maybe 13, 15, doing these kind of heavy drugs. What do you think is going to happen? Right. You're, 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 you, if I told you, if I told the parent, you know, look, I'm just going to come over and, and smash your kid in the head a couple of times with a sledgehammer. How do you feel about that? I, I think we can all agree they'd say, that's terrible. We wouldn't do that. Okay. Right. Well, why is this any different? Problem is people say it's legal. And the, the child... They do all their homework and research to find the answers they want. They say, well, it's safe. It's natural. It's not natural. It's not like a tomato that grows naturally. Um, it's farmed, and it has a higher THC content than ever before. So all the drugs generally have gotten stronger. Alcohol, probably not, but you know, opiates became stronger. Uh, what they call benzodiazepines, which are the, you know, the Xanaxes and Clonopins of the world, and they all affect personality. So we want to prevent the onset of use as best as we can, and then when we see there's a problem, we need to intervene. And you have to know just enough signs that something's wrong, and then you have to figure out, and this is the work that people come to people like me for, is how are you going to get this to stop? And my take is that people have to become the interventionist themselves. That's empowerment. Thank you, Dr. Ross. So definitely family members and, and when we talk about family members, we're talking about neighbors and spouses, anyone who's around that individual, not only they need therapy uh, to, like you said, know how to treat this kind of personality uh, because we're not really dealing with the person that we knew. Because obviously, um, and well, unfortunately, this addiction um, makes you a different person. Uh, so you're not dealing with a real person that you know. So we also need to be cautious about that too, right? Because, I mean, I'm sure people have heard the media and very sad stories have happened along, you know, of um, extremes, <laughs> you know. And, and, and again, it's about recognizing if the patient cannot, in this case, or the individual cannot recognize their signs, then hopefully some people around them can do and then uh, put them in, in some sort of therapy like yours where they can really help them before they fall deeper, which is going to be harder uh, to pull them out 
uh, from it. And even before they go to rehab, if we can avoid them, why not? Um, if, you but, can, if you can, great. And sometimes, unfortunately, you can't. And that may be the, the reason you decide to put someone in a rehab center uh, because it's a safety measure. For their sake, your sake, uh, and, you know, very often, unfortunately, we see this too often, is there's children involved. Ugh, terrible. Which is painful. So, you know, a child watches this. You're modeling the behaviors for the child. So it, it's, a, it's a very difficult cycle uh, to get out, and somebody has to be really expert. And that's why I implore people to get as much information as help as they can. Generally, people do know the signs at the get-go. And then there's, you know, there's deeper signs. When you, when you look at the physical signs, watching people's eyes, um, you know, but over time, what we do know is drugs will eventually damage somebody's brain. Any which way you slice it, any consistent use is probably going to wear on the brain. Especially, doctor, because of the fact of things being so synthetic. Like you said, they're not as natural as they used to be 20, 30 years ago. And the same thing, people were, I remember back in my generation, <laughs> and we might share the same one, uh, you know, the fact was, what was back then? The, the, the trend, if you want to call it, was cocaine, right? That was a big trend. Um, and marijuana. I mean, those were the two big ones. And alcohol. Those were the three ones. Now we have, we're dealing with, like you said, with all these different things that we were not exposed to, at least I wasn't. And, um, and apparently they way stronger and they have even a harsh, uh, you know, uh, ending because these are, well, you lose your mind. I mean, you start hallucinating all these kind of things and, and they're not there. It's not a reality, right? They're living in, in a cloud. Uh, so, and, and if you've seen all this violence that also are kind of connected to, to, you know, people not having a clear mind and, and when it comes to all this um, violence that we see because of drugs, that's what it is. Let's talk a little bit about alcohol. Um, uh, how, to what extreme do you, uh, if there's a comparable that you could do between alcohol and drugs, I mean, are they pretty much on the same level or, or is there a difference when it comes drug. to... It's a drug. It's a drug. It's a drug. If, you look at, if you look at the reality of anything that we can consider a drug, we look at the consequences. So, you know, generally the more people use any type of drug, they have uh, more frequent problems, they have more intense problems, and eventually it leads to something much bigger or worse. Uh, you know, just like diabetes would. We call it, you know, chronic, progressive, and fatal over time. So... Alcohol is legal for, you know, what, 100, almost 100 years now, so I guess since prohibition. Yeah. Right. So um, it has a medicinal purpose, you know, historically. It has a ceremonial purpose, religion-wise. True. Outside of that, then it has a recreational purpose. Yeah. However, the medicinal, the way it used to be versus the medicinal now is habitual, and that's to self-medicate. So you can damage yourself with alcohol the same way you can every other drug. Now, are the addictive properties the same? Well, to some people, they're going to be exactly the same. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of what people don't want to understand. Alcohol is a drug. Marijuana is a drug. One is legal. One is becoming legal. Um, but to the, to the wrong person, so to speak, they're going to use it. If, they're, if they use it in any other way other than what I would call, you know, recreational, social, or ceremonial, um, you know, some religions may have a glass of wine like on a, on a, on a dinner once a week. Right. So it has a purpose there. Anything else, you have to wonder, why is the person using it? You need food and you need water and you need shelter, right? right. After that, you have to wonder what the purpose is. And even food, as an example, can be a drug mm -hmm. a certain amount of food but we have an obesity crisis still why people are self-medicating with food too because we're, we're detaching we're trying to feed something really unhealthy and something really sad something very empty and no matter what you do to nurture it if you do it the wrong way it never gets better again why therapy is important too Incredible. Those are such a true facts, doctor. Uh, you know, what, what, what really amazes me is, like you said, obesity is a, is a major issue also here in the States. Uh, I think we're one of the, the, the highest in, in, in worldwide, isn't it? Uh, 
people gaining excessively weight. And again, it's because unfortunately we deal with so much um, additives and, and unhealthy foods um, that people are not taking care of their health. Um, so obviously you're going to suffer consequences at the long term because you find a lot of people that even in the early 20s, they're out of shape completely. And they, they don't realize that once they start having, you know, their self-esteem start to drop and they look at themselves in the mirror, then now they're going to try to do something else to ease that pain uh, and, and, and right. feeling because they're out of the, the society. Society is, is judging them for their appearance, right? Um, so it, it's really a, a very deep, and one of the things that I have noticed is also in in, in this gen, new generation, millennial generation, as we call it, right under 35 years old, they're going to college, they're going to university, and I don't know, this is from my perspective, what I've been uh, uh, kind of watching is they're overweight. A lot of them are overweight, more than our generation. Mm -hmm. that's and right. that's concerning. That's why I think they're also falling and finding other recreational drugs because they're trying to, um, I guess, justify or ease their pain. And so now now we have problems with addiction with the food, now they have with certain drugs. That's right. We're so not preparing them the same way we used to. Coping strategies are not the same, and they're not being taught, and they're not being reinforced. And we're in a position now that parents really need to be, you know, we talked about this the, the previous episode, is mindfulness. And one spot that mindfulness comes in is in terms of having a parenting plan and really getting that in place to say, what's the job of a parent? Ultimately, the job is to make a resilient child. That's a child that can function no matter what life throws at them. And nowadays, it's even more important because life throws a lot more than it did when you and I were growing up, for well, sure. Well, look at this. We love it. Our smartphones. Exactly. We love it. But yeah. guess what? In my, in, from my own opinion, okay, I feel this could be bad. I mean, I can think be. that... Can be, yep. Because this is an addiction. I, 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 I recognize this as an addiction. Uh, I mean, there's people spending more time on their smartphones texting, not even calling, which is even worse because back in our times, we used to pick up the phone and say, hello, we used to talk to people. Now we texting or we going to social media and we're doing all these things and people are, you know, they're, they're, they're not being part of the tribe. They're not being part of a, a, a friendship circle. Everything is so, you know, artificial. And then what did you see in social media? Everybody wants to talk about their happy side. No one wants to talk about what's wrong in their lives. So this is creating, oh, yeah. this is creating more problems in our society. So uh, parenting is definitely a, a, a big plus that I think that parents now have to deal a lot more than they did in the past. But you know, Dr. Ross, I want to thank you so much because first of all, like I said, I, I really believe that a lot of people who listen to you know my show and watch the videos, they need to realize that they're parents too and, and raising their children and hopefully they can start seeing this signs of problems that their you know children might be having and if not they can recognize in themselves if they already have an addiction uh, because no matter what you're gonna fix your children too so I think we all need to seek help and not be embarrassed about it and, and know that when the time comes there's nothing better than having true support and someone professional like you that can just kind of, um, you know, uh, make us reflect uh, what might be our issues uh, without being criticized, right? Because that's one of the things I think as humans we're so afraid of. Oh, she's going to say this and he's going to say that. And oh my God, now everybody knows about my problems, how embarrassing I am. No, someone like you. So, uh, Jason, how can the audience reach you? Because that way they know they can uh, try and get some help from you. And, and do you offer any kind of like um, uh, sort of like video calls like these uh, for sessions? Um, do you have an evaluation process? Can you explain that a little bit before we wrap up the episode, please? Sure, sure. If they, you know, if you, they want to find me, my website, jasonericross.com. Okay. On social media, it's at Jason Eric Ross. It's always my full name, Jason Eric Ross. You know, on any that's I've been lucky enough to get that. As far as what I do, I do an assessment. Usually, it's in person. Although I do work remotely, the world has changed that I had to adapt to that. So you know, using things like Zoom, 
uh, et cetera, that are compliant for HIPAA regulations. So most of the people work with me in person, but I do do it remotely and it's assessing what is the need of the client. And you know, when I have somebody in active addiction, that's a different issue. Uh, some people come to me, they want help with a loved one. They can do that remotely too, it's easier. Someone who's in the middle of an active addiction, you have to look at what are the dangers we're looking at right now. And that's you know, what ultimately decides, do we have to put somebody in a detox? Do they need to go to rehab? Um, and it's really aligning a family together that they can set the limits and boundaries they need to. Uh, but the evaluation process is important. And you know, very often, the first time, uh, they're in my office physically in front of me. Okay. So I think it helps. And, 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 you know, Jason, to, to end up here, but, I mean, I think that for the people who are listening to, I mean, even if you fall off the wagon, as the expression call it, get back in and do it yeah. over and over. Whatever it takes, do it. Whether you need to move from the place you are in your environment, let go of those kind of toxic, you know, quote, unquote, friends that you think they are. Uh, because, like you said, not everyone, I, I think, can make it. Some of us would be easier for them to go back to society and, and, and what we call normal life. And I don't think it really exists, but <laughs> um, because we all live in a bubble one way or another, we all create our own little world. Um, but whatever it takes, I mean, as long as you have the support, again, from psychotherapists like, like Dr. You know, Jason and Ron, and then also your family support, because they're always going to be there no matter what happens in the majority of times. And, but if you need to just break the barriers and move and do whatever it takes, do it because your life is worth it. So yeah, with that yeah, said, yeah, no, exactly. So with that said, don't lose faith and don't lose, uh, especially, you know, your, your belief that you can do it. You can do it if you really put your mind to it and your heart and your soul. Just try to substitute what you're doing with something more, what we call it, fun. Uh, you know, more fun. Go to the gym, start working out, start looking good. Uh, you Self -care. know, Self-care every which way is great. And willingness gets you there. Willingness. Thank you for sharing that word with us. And, and, and just, you know, do things that are fun. There's so many wonderful things that life offer us that those things are not. And we know, we can recognize them they're not good for us. Get rid of them, our selfie, right? And substitute them with something else. Because I think it's easier when you substitute one thing with something else, as long as it's something good, <laughs> right? <Yeah>. Very much so. <laughs> right? Then in that case, what we can do is, like I said, start joining the gym. Go to meditation, do yoga, anything that's going to make you happy, feel wonderful about yourself, knowing that you're getting rid of that. And like I shared a little bit earlier in the episode, I'm an ex smoker And believe it or not, even after, you know, for a year that I have stopped, I still have my days that I wish I kind of think, mm, you know, that would be nice. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself. So, again, I just... When I have those thoughts that come to my mind, I try to replace them with something different that's going to make me feel yes. much better. So, again, Doctor, thank you so much. I love that you had joined us again for another amazing episode. And, and, you know, again, I hope everyone listening, please get help, 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 help. Don't feel shy. Don't feel intimidated. Just get the help that you need because you can do it. And I know you can. I have faith in all of you out there, okay? So God bless everyone. Thank you, Dr. Jason Ross. And I wish you a lot of success. And I hope that we stay connected. And like I said, and we're going to put your website on the uh, profile. That way people can reach out in case they have any questions or so on, okay? Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me again. I really enjoyed it. Thank Take you. care of yourself.